stand up. All right, is this mic on now? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. And um, I put myself first because I knew it would be the smallest crowd getting us going. So all of you who came out so early in the year, I really appreciate it. Um, in my 15 years as an educator, I've had some really amazing experiences. I've been fortunate enough to work with students all over the United States and all over the world. However, this mission that you're gonna hear about today, and that's how I refer to it in my mind this whole time, is a mission, was next level. Um, it was not anything I ever thought my job would entail, but it was a pretty amazing story. I make a pledge at the beginning of each mini boat year to my students that I will do everything in my power to rescue their mini boat if it gets shipwrecked. And that's how I found myself on a Fiji Air 737 headed to the Atoll of Tarawa in the Republic of Kiribati. Um, the mini boat program, we should do a quick little background. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, but for those of you who are not, uh, the mini boat program provides a global multidisciplinary STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics experience for fifth through seventh grade classes in the United States and Japan. We empower them to build, design, launch, and then track a GPS-enabled mini boat for a voyage across the Pacific Ocean. Since 2017, more than 1,200 students on both sides of the Pacific Ocean have been involved in the launch of 24 mini boats that as of this morning have traveled a combined 55,469 nautical miles, probably more than that now because that was from this morning. <laughs> Uh, this boat pictured right here is the sailing vessel Nishikaze. She was the first boat we started construction on in 2017. The Nishikaze was special from day one. And part of what made her so special were the amazing students who were in this class and probably the best teacher that I've ever worked with and also the only teacher who's ever had the opportunity to get a mini boat twice. That's how fantastic she is. And both her and her daughter, Lucy, who was, actually I'll show you, right here, when she was in fifth grade, were in this class. And they are both here today. Uh, Jane and Lucy, could you please stand up and could everybody please give them a round of applause. So over eight weeks in the fall of 2017, every Monday morning, I would get up at about four in the morning and zip down, one time even hitting a deer on my way to her classroom. And we would spend the day building, writing letters, getting this mini boat ready to go. And one of the things with the mini boat program is the students get to choose where they want to launch their vessel from. And this class decided they wanted their boat launched off of Baja. They were the first class to come up with that idea, which is a brilliant idea, because it kicks up those trade winds and kicks it off to sea. So that was their major plan. We just had to find a boat. Again, this was the first year, so we didn't have all of our contacts. We had to find a boat willing to launch it for us. So I put out my feelers with the Columbia River Bar Pilots. Hey, if you know a ship that's you know, heading south, would you let us know and maybe they can launch a mini boat for us? So about 20 minutes before this photo was taken, my phone is just buzzing and buzzing and buzzing. And to be honest, I thought it was my wife and I was like, whatever. Um, but then it kept on going. I thought, well, maybe it's like an emergency. Maybe I should look at my phone. Um, you know, I'm covered in paint and epoxy. So I pull up my phone and I see I have four missed calls from Captain Dan Jordan, who, um, who works for the Columbia River Bar Pilots. And then a text message came out and it said, hey, does that boat still want to go south? I have a ship who's willing to launch it. It's leaving in two hours. <laughs> Mind you, I'm in southeast Portland, and this boat is even sealed up and ready to go. So I quickly said to the students, do you still want this to happen? And they said, yeah, and we, 
I mean, Lucy, do you remember how quick we sealed up that? It was a really a quick thing. And we, no ceremonies. We just took a quick picture, sat on the stairs, said goodbye, and out we went. And is it Bruce still here? OK, good. I drove really, really fast <laughs> to get here. And I made it here in two hours from southeast Portland at 2.30 in the afternoon. That is a miracle. Probably never happen again. <laughs> so as I rush in, the cable ship decisive is waiting at anchor for us. So we rush to the pilot station, and we load the boat onto the Connor Foss, take a little photograph, and pull up alongside the ship right out front of here in the museum. The bar pilot climbed aboard, and they put a rope around the Nishikaze and hauled her on. This was the last time I would see the Nishikaze for about 16 months. Right before they launch her, they sent me this picture. We have no photographs of the Nishikaze actually being launched, but this guy making the muscles is probably my favorite mini boat photo ever. <laughs> um, the crews really come together. The captains, you know, we're always saying, oh, we're so sorry that you've got to like stop and take time to do this. And they said, it's one thing that brings everybody on the ship together. So it's kind of a, a really neat thing for them. So the Nishikaze sailed for 398 days, 10,846,000 ,000 nautical miles. Whenever I would go and visit the class, other mini boats were crashing places, some were disappearing, and I just called the Nishikaze, I said, it was boringly good. It didn't do anything but sail the way it was supposed to sail. So I never really worried about it. I knew every day when I would check on it that she would be there. So, on January 4th of last year, when I checked in the morning and the Nishikaze disappeared, it was extremely heartbreaking. This, this was the special boat to us, and it had traveled so far. And we had no idea what happened. There wasn't a big storm. Sometimes when there's, right now, our mini boats that were launched in Japan um, on Thanksgiving are battling 38 foot waves as we speak right now. So you imagine that's like 72 feet of water coming on these mini boats. And there was nothing here. And so we're really perplexed about what had happened. But the Nishikaze was never far from my mind. And one night, which is my typical routine, is I put my daughter to bed. I may or may not open a Fort George or a Bowie beer and open my laptop and check on my emails and the mini boats and some other work that I had to do. And I open my email and this was there. No subject, started with other. We found one boat and small plastic paper with piece of paper right on this website and then my email address. The adrenaline just <laughs> flowed through my body, and I screamed out loud, and my daughter yells, what's going on, Dad? And I said, a mini boat. And she says, I figured, and she went back to bed. <laughs> and I was just like, what mini boat is it? Because there was two mini boats that had gone lost in the South Pacific. And I was like, we didn't know where they were. I thought, which one is it? So I emailed this woman back, and she emailed me immediately. And within two hours, I mean, the internet is an amazing thing. We were Facebook friends. <laughs> um, and we were just emailing back and forth and just learning all about our country. And it turns out she was from a place called Kiribati, which to be honest, probably like most of you, I had never heard of before. And there'll be a little bit more background about Kiribati in a minute. But it was fascinating. In those couple of months, the Nishikaze sailed at least 2,000 miles from where we last heard from her. So Kiribati um, is actually the only country in the world that spans all four hemispheres. Um, it's made up of three separate islands, the Gilberts, the Phoenix, and the Line Islands. Um, you might have heard of a place called Christmas Island that is in Kiribati. It's just about 3,000 miles away from the Kiribati that I was in. So as my mind is running and I'm talking to this woman and I'm thinking, well, I mean, I've got to go, right? I mean, you've got to go check, get this boat fixed up. That was a promise that I made. So I'm driving into work the next morning, coming in early, and I see Sam's car is parked in the parking lot. And so I walk into his office, and I just, just was straightforward. I sat down, and I said, Sam, 
I need $5,000. <laughs> and he, I mean, mind you, this is like 7 in the morning. He was kind of stunned, and he looked at me, and I'll never forget it. He said, what, am I your dad? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't need $5,000. The mini boats need $5,000 because one was shipwrecked in Kiribati. And again, Sam said, where the hell is Kiribati? <laughs> And so I explained to him that Kiribati, again, is over four hemispheres, 33 atolls, and Tarawa is halfway between Hawaii and Australia. And what also makes this such a special place to shipwreck this mini boat is Tarawa was the site of one of the bloodiest battles in World War II, where more people died in 48 hours than any other battle during the war. So it was a very poignant place as well. Um, and the other interesting thing about Kiribati is several years ago, and if you have heard about them, this is probably the story you've heard, is the president of Kiribati bought land in Fiji to evacuate his people. The highest point on all of those atolls is two meters above sea level. So what that means with the king tides that we're experiencing this week, they'll experience those as well, but the entire island will flood. And you combine that with a storm and some of the causeways they've built and their islands are deteriorating, the I Kiribati, is, is the way that they call themselves, will be the first refugees for climate change. Um, and they're losing islands as we speak right now. So that's sort of the background about, about Kiribati. And Sam looked at me and he said, and this is why I have the best job in the world. <laughs> After I spiel that out, he looked at me and he said, all right, book a ticket. I'll figure out how to raise the money for it. And off we went on our adventure. So this is the first picture that I got of the Nishikaze. Um, and Jaina, if you remember, it took over a month to get this photo. With all the talking, I kept on saying, oh, can I get a photo of the boat? And she was like, okay, I'll, I'll get you one. And then just, I wouldn't hear from her for times. Um, the internet connection is really, really spotty over there. Well, it turns out, Monica didn't find the mini boat. Her brother did, who lives way far away from the main capital called Beso Town in Tarawa. So to get this photo, her brother came to the market. She gave him her cell phone. He took it home. A month later, came back to the market and gave her her cell phone with these photos. I'm not sure about you, but I certainly wouldn't be giving my cell phone away for an entire month to help some weird chubby education director across the Pacific Ocean. Um, but that's just the I hear boss. They would do anything they could to help complete this mission. So a couple of months later, after school got out, I boarded a flight from San Francisco to Fiji, where I had a 12-hour layover before I boarded the 737 for the four hour flight to Kiribati. And so this is on final approach and I'm looking out the window and I had never seen somewhere so beautiful in my entire life. And as we're pulling into land and taxing to the airport, a gentleman sitting next to me asked what I was doing in Kiribati, which is a pretty normal question, being that Kiribati is the third least visited country in the entire world. And don't ask me a question about why I'm there. I went on to a rant about the mini boats and what I was doing. And as we were walking off the plane, he gives me his business card. Turns out I was sitting next to the Minister of Commerce. And he says, hey, if you run into any problems, stop by the parliament building and talk to me. And so this was really exciting because besides Monica, the only other person I could make contact with in the country of Kiribati was somebody who ran a website who didn't even live there. Um, his parents lived there and he said I could help, they could maybe help me out as well. So I had a really good contact. I was feeling really, really good. As I'm getting my bags, and by the way, the International Airport used to be a shack, and they're building a brand new building. They're really proud of it. So as we're pulling in, there's only three jets a week that fly to Kiribati. So you know, it's a very exciting deal. They stopped. Um, you can notice that the luggage carts are hand push. So as I'm fighting through the crowds of people at the airport, this crocodile hunter looking guy, <laughs> 
who reeked like alcohol, and I you imagine the beers this guy was putting on. He was sitting in front of me, um, putting down on this plane. And he comes walking up to me, and I could hardly understand him, because um, maybe of his alcohol content, maybe just of his accent. And he just keeps on telling me how interested he was in what I was doing. I heard you on the plane. I'm very interested in what you're doing. I'm very interested in what you're doing. And I'd walk and get my bag, and he'd be right next to me. Yeah, I'm very interested. And I was like, I get it, man. Like, I'm, you know, I haven't slept in 48 hours. You know, leave me alone. And so as I'm walking out with my backpack and my luggage, he comes up to me one more time, tells me again how interested he is, and says, mate, I've been coming here for 25 years. I know all the locals. I'm staying at Mary's Hotel. Find me if you need me. And I was like, yeah, sure, buddy. Well, we'll go out for drinks. <laughs> um, so we're heading out of the airport. This is the pay station. And driving to my hotel, which I didn't really know what to expect. Um, and as we're driving there, again, just rushing through. I have no time to waste. I have three days in the country and I need to find the Nishikaze and I have no idea where she is except for a name of a village. So quickly I pull into the hotel and I was super excited because it's nicer than most Hampton Inns that I've stayed at. Uh, so I was really, really lucky. I saw Mary's Hotel, which is the only other hotel on, in Tarawa. Did not look this nice. So I, I was feeling very, very fortunate. So I immediately set out to find a boat to take me across the atoll to look for the Nishikaze. And the way you get around on the island, there is one road, and there are these buses, which are just these vans at the door. They had to open the door from the outside. And typically, it was the husband who was driving, and then the wife taking money in a little change box, opening and closing the door. And we were just pushing as many people into here. I should also add that it is 89 degrees and 90% humidity. So I'm just sweating thinking about this video right here. And so I went off exploring, looking for a boat like this to hire to take me across the atoll. And so if you look at these pictures, it's, it's beautiful. And I wanted nothing more than to jump off this pier with these boys until I looked in the water, and I'll spare you, I did not put the photos in, when you saw feces and medical waste floating in the water. Um, this is the reality of Kiribati. Um, it is one of the most polluted places, which you just, it doesn't really make sense. There's no garbage, there's no landfills. If a car breaks down, the car sits there forever. There are just abandoned cars, just stripped or just everywhere on the island. Um, if you have plumbing, which a lot of people just go into the lagoon and do their business, if you do have, luckily, indoor plumbing, the outflow is only 100 yards out into the lagoon. Um, so the atoll, the lagoon, it's not a safe place to swim. Um, but we'll save all of the, the trash talk and the climate change talk for, for another time. We're here for a mini boat. And most importantly, the people are the friendliest, happiest people that I've ever met in my entire life. Um, this chicken had a leash around its, <laughs> and they were out just walking it. Um, I would say 90% of the people on the island didn't even own a pair of shoes. And about 95% of the people did not work. There are really no jobs in Kiribati. So as I'm walking around uh, looking for a boat, as you can see in the second photo, I'm looking a little upset. When I finally found somebody willing to take me, they wanted $1,400, which was more money than I had on me. So that wasn't happening. It was also really, really hot. <laughs> Even the feral dogs, and there are just these skinny, mangy dogs everywhere on the atoll, even they were taking shade and rest. I should have been smart like them. But again, I had a mission to do, and I had three days to get it done. As I'm walking back to the hotel dejected, a school bus pulls by, and all the kids start yelling at me, I maintain, I maintain, which is what they call foreigner. And I kind of felt like a celebrity. It was pretty exciting. <laughs> and so I walk over and I start talking to them and they don't understand really anything that I'm saying. We do a couple of selfies and I kind of got a little kick in my step and I was like, all right, this is, we're going to do this. 
And I'm walking back to the hotel. This is the entrance to my hotel. And this little truck pulls up and two Australians get out, an older couple. And so immediately I walk up to them and I'm like, what are you guys doing here? Like, you're the only other people staying at this hotel besides me. And they explain that they are university professors and tomorrow they were bringing eight student teachers for a two week trip to teach in North Tarawa where the mini boat was. And I said, how are you getting there? <laughs> and they said, oh, well, we hired a boat from Mary's hotel. And I said, got any room on that boat? And she said, you got any money? And I said, I got 100 bucks. And she said, you're in. So she said, meet us here the next day at 9 in the morning, and we'll go to Mary's, get on the boat, and we'll get things going. So now I am feeling really, really excited I'm feeling really, really good. So I went out for a walk. And you know me, I just, I see some kids. I'm like, what's happening? That was terrible. Believe it or not, I've never played soccer. I don't have a video of me doing it. Right between the cones, I did it. So meeting the local kids, just walking around, and as the sun starts to fall, the air starts to cool, Kiribati comes alive. And I felt alive. It, it was amazing. They have this saying, the greatest insult in Kiribati is don't be like a white person. And what they mean by that is when you're walking down the street, and there's only one street, <laughs> when you're walking down the street, and you're sharing space with somebody, you need to make eye contact and give them a, a warm, friendly greeting. You know, treat everybody as a, as a matter because we all do matter. And that was a really special thing. It's just seeing everybody out and about just kind of talking and talking about the day. It was really, really electric. And I did have, I'm not a fish eater, but there wasn't much else to eat there unless you like spam. Um, so I had some special lobster that is only found in Tarawa, but it's not from the lagoon, just so you know. It's not from the lagoon. And so I finally went to bed and I slept so good, woke up the next morning, we went down to Mary's hotel, helped the student teachers load up all their luggage, and I'm thinking, you know, I brought like a backpack and these people have these like wheeled suitcases and I'm thinking, good luck getting that onto the piano. I don't know how you're doing that. And so as we're almost getting ready to go, the head teacher comes over to me and she says, well, we talked to the boat captain and it turns out they can't bring you where you need to go. They're only going to bring us where we can go and they're coming right back. She said, you can still ride with us, but you're going to have to walk from little islet to islet, little islands from place to place at low tide. And I thought, that is not a good idea. I have one backpack with just mini boat supplies. But it was that decision, do I go or do I not go? And I decided not to go. And as I walked out, who walked in? <laughs> out back, Gary. <laughs> and that's when I called him in my head. And he comes up to me and he says, Mate, did you find your boat? And I told him the story that I didn't and what had happened. And he told me not to panic and he'd be right back. Gary comes back with three Victoria bitters, which are Australian beers. And he sits down and he tells me, and I, I have his exact quote right here. You made the right choice by not getting on that boat with those teachers. By the way, Gary had a very, very profane language, which I will not repeat. But uh, something like... F, mate, that would have been a bad idea. Do you know how big North Tarawa is? And then my favorite quote, you've got Gary now, he said. <laughs> I'll help you get your boat back. I'm very interested in what you were doing. <laughs> so after those beers and maybe a couple more, it was hot out, the plan ended up being that Gary was going to pick me up the next morning at noon at my hotel, and he guaranteed me he could get us a boat for $400, and if not, he would pay the difference. So I immediately hopped on the next bus back up to my hotel, but a lot of things were running through my mind. I'm a pretty trusting individual, but this Gary guy, I just didn't, I didn't know. Who, who was he? Was he, oh yeah, he was a blowhard. 
Uh, you should have heard some of the stories he talked about. But was he really going to show up the next day? Could I count on him? How crazy was he? And how drunk was he? I was really concerned. And then I talked to my wife on the phone, and she was like, you should not trust this guy. I can tell you that right now. And she was right. And so that evening, I started preparing a plan C. What if Gary did not show up at my hotel the next day? So I started going through everything that I knew about Tarawa. The mini boat is up here. My hotel is right here. And the main road runs here and stops. It's 37 miles from here to there. So I'm not going to walk it. That's for sure not going to happen. And then this map with the village circled, that's the only map that I have showing this village. And when I show it to people in Tarawa, they kind of look at me like, I don't really know where that is. I don't really know much about that. And so I really figured I needed a boat. And I was looking at my drone footage that when I took there, we are looking now out over the lagoon. So the mini boat is way over here. This will be a better view here. So this is the ocean side. This is the lagoon side. And my mini boat is right. Whoa, stop. Right here is where the mini boat is. So not going to walk it, not going to happen. So I thought, better go pull all of my cards and go talk to the Minister of Commerce. I let him know that I maybe had a boat procured for the next day, but I wasn't really sure if it was going to work out. He said, let me know what happens. I'm sure I can try to help you out in one way or another. But again, I don't really want to bother the Minister of Commerce. But I did get a cool tour of Parliament, which was pretty cool as well. So as I'm walking back to the hotel, and here's just not being like a white person. Larry! And that's hello in the Kiribati language. And again, I just, something about getting honked at and people yelling out the window nice things to you instead of like, hey, get out of the road. It, it was really just, it just felt electric in this place. Just, they had nothing, but they were so happy. It was, was really amazing. So I had some fresh tuna fish and some french fries for dinner. And then again, hit that pillow and was out. The next morning, Monica, the woman who had originally contacted me about the boat, had asked if she could come pick me up, and she wanted to give me a tour of Basotown, where she lived. And so we went a tour of Basotown, which I will tell you, interesting fact, is the most densely populated place on Earth. There are more people per square mile than in Hong Kong where she lives. It was really amazing. And so after she toured around and we looked at everything, she said, I want to take you here. I have a surprise. And so we go into the store and they take me into this back room. And then all of a sudden, these four I care bus ladies start touching me all over my body. <laughs> what is going on here? And then I realized that they had measuring tapes and they were doing my inseam and all this stuff and just trying to stay comfortable. <laughs> and you know, I, I thought it was legitimate. And she didn't tell me, she said, I can't tell you, it's a surprise. And we had plans the night before I left that she wanted to throw a feast in the mini boat's honor. And so the plan was I would see her the next day for the big feast. She dropped me back off at the hotel. And I was getting ready to get picked up by Gary, hopefully, in about an hour. And as I walk into the hotel, the woman working there says, oh, your friend was here. And I'm thinking, my friend, the only person I know I was just with. And I said, my friend? And she said, yeah, big, loud, Australian. I was like, Gary. And she said, yeah, Gary. And she said, he left a note under your door. And this was the note from Gary. B. Mary's 12-ish. I love his, his, so Gary, I should mention, um, does water tanks for the Australian embassy. He's in charge of their water systems on all the atolls in the Pacific. And, <laughs> A couple of people from the Australian embassy had to be medevaced out because they were getting sick from the water. So Gary came in to fix a problem. And his tank, I love it, we get it done, is his, his motto. So I look at this and it says, be Mary's 12-ish. I'm like, I got to go now. So I hop in the next bus and I'm heading about the half an hour drive down to Mary's hotel, which cost about 50 cents in the bus to go. By the way, every one of these buses was either playing Christmas hip hop 
or pop music from like the 80s. It was pretty amazing. So we pull into to Mary's hotel and I see Gary's Subaru parked right there. And where's Gary gonna be but the bar, Bloody Mary's bar. So I walk in there and Gary says to me, great news. I got the gardener from the Australian embassy to take us in his boat. And he's only gonna charge us $200 plus 50 bucks for fuel. And then some swear words. <laughs> so then Gary orders us six beers, three sandwiches, and two orders of french fries for the hour long boat ride across the lagoon. <laughs> and then he says to me, F, Nate, Bobo, the gardener, and now our captain, doesn't have any life jackets. And my wife is going to kill me if I die. And this is the first I've heard about his wife, because I've been hearing about Gary likes to go out and meet women on the island. So I was like, wife? And I said, make flotation? And he looked at me and he said, we're in Kiribati, mate. And he walked out the door. And luckily, he came back in about 10 minutes, and he had real life jackets for us. Neither one would fit around either of us chubby guys, but we had them with us. We were ready to go. So with our sandwiches and beers and fries, we head over to Bobo's house. This is Bobo's house. And right before we leave, Gary calls Bobo's son over, who is probably about seven or eight years old, pulls out $20 which is over a week's wages for if you have a job in Kiribati and gives the 20 bucks to the kid and the kid's eyes just got huge. This wasn't the first time that I've seen Gary give money to people in Kiribati and he told me, I just, it's just fun. He's like, you see that kid's face? The kid is never gonna forget that. And you know, they can buy whatever they want. They can help out their family. But just, Gary was just this real interesting, interesting character. So we hop onto the boat, Bobo's boat, 30 horsepower motor, for the hour trip across the lagoon. It was amazing. For the first time, I was not hot in Kiribati. And Gary's amazing mustache was flowing with the wind. <laughs> Bobo was having a great time. It was just, it was really, really awesome. And then we kind of realized, Bobo didn't know where he was going. He kind of was heading across, but he, didn't, he had no idea where this village was. Luckily for us, we see a guy fishing on an outrigging canoe, and so we pull up. <laughs> and he's happy, and we pull in. And then this part was straight, I mean, I wish I had a film of this. It was straight out of a movie. As we're pulling closer, a couple of kids see us and they start yelling and more people start emerging out of the banana leaf huts and the palm trees. And as we're crawling out of the boat, they're all laughing. I pull out a picture of the Nishikaze and they just smile, like they knew that's why I was there. You know, they knew that's why I was there. And so, they said, follow us, and they, we went through the village, past a pig. Do you see the pig there? <laughs> past some homes, and people just started following behind us. It was like our own little mini boat parade. <laughs> and as the kids lead us around a corner, for the first time in 16 months, I saw the Nishikaze. And she was sitting under a hut. I mean, can you believe that? I mean, it wasn't just like, you know, thrown up by a tree. It was like in a place of honor. It's amazing. And so literally when I saw that, I screamed, our mini boat. And by the way, at this time, Gary stopped referring to it as my mini boat and started referring to it as our mini boat. <laughs> and I just go chucking and running. And it was amazing. And so we start talking. And this is actually the first time I've heard what had happened to the Nishikaze. And so it turns out this is Monica's brother's wife. And in Kiribati, as a woman, you move in with your husband's family and you don't go back and visit your own village. So she hadn't been back there since she had been married. And so they start telling me the story that Monica's brother saw the Nishikaze sailing in and he jumped into the ocean, swam out over the reef, and then escorted her on shore. 
And that's why she had no damage whatsoever. So immediately, we were going to get her back to the hotel and get her ready to go back out to sea. So as we're carrying it, I should mention Gary has the gout, so is sometimes just walking isn't so great. Now, oh, surprise, surprise, right? Gary has the gout. Um, so as we're walking, he's like, mates, we got to think smarter, not work harder. He's like, we need to get this thing to the water and float it back to Bobo's boat. Great idea. So the villagers show us a water path through the mangrove forest that leads us out into the lagoon. And this is the first time that I've seen water that didn't have things floating in it that shouldn't be there. And I wanted to swim more than anything in the world. <laughs> so I said to Bobo, is it safe to swim here? And he's like, yeah, it's totally safe. So I throw my backpack on the mini boat and I literally swam back to Bobo's boat as Bobo is pushing the mini boat and Gary is yelling, is it safe for Nate to swim here, Bobo? Is, are you sure it's safe for Nate to swim here? All, you know, being my protector. And so we get it loaded up into Bobo's boat, trying to beat the tide back. And I notice Bobo starts looking around the boat. And he's, we say, like, what's going on? And he says, I can't find the plug. It's little and it's black. So... That's kind of an important thing, right? So we're like looking all over the boat, all over the boat. And then after a couple of minutes, Bobo just kicks it into gear and says, ah, we'll be fine. <laughs> and to this day, I don't know if he was just messing with us or if we really didn't have the plug. But um, so we started heading out across. This is the only photo of the boat trip ride I have back because a huge storm came in. Now, we couldn't see across the lagoon anyway at this point. But as this storm came in, you could hardly see 10 feet in front of you. And it was raining so it was raining harder than it was yesterday, if you were here. And we are being pelted and the sea kicks up. And I instantly became acutely aware of the two life jackets that Gary had procured. And I was also thankful I doubled my life insurance before I went. Just never knew what was gonna happen. And so I was a little nervous, but you know, I like a good boat ride. And then I look over at Gary, and he is white as a ghost. And then I think, if this crazy Aussie is scared, like, I should be scared too. And then this huge wave, like, Bobo was kicking it fast across this. And this huge wave comes over and almost capsizes us, and Gary's freaking out. And Bobo slows down a little bit and then speeds up, and there was three times this boat almost capsized. I should have been more scared than I was. But luckily, we emerge out of the storm and pull into the harbor. And who is there waiting for us but the Minister of Commerce? He had heard from the island grapevine that we had, I mean, things travel fast on this island. Um, he had heard that we had left with Bobo to go get the mini boat. So he was waiting for us there with his brand new, it was the only new car I saw there, Nissan pickup truck. And so then a little argument, a, kind of goes on between him and Gary about who's taking me in the mini boat back to the hotel. You know, Gary's like, I can fit in the Subaru, you know? And the minister's like, well, I want to take it. So Gary ended up winning, took me in the mini boat back to the hotel and tells me, I have this quote here too, this is pretty great. Mate, you have to work to do, so I'm going out to get pissed. Call my hotel at 10 a.m. and tell them to wake my ass up and I'll come get you at 11. I'm really confident with that. <laughs> really confident. So I get the mini boat back to the hotel. I open up the cargo hatch. Lucy, do you remember this? All the stuff that was inside. It was all there. And it explains why the GPS stopped working. It was smashed into like five or six pieces. So uh, the next year, we actually built a new mounting system for the GPS, and um, I brought a new mounting system and a new GPS, mounted the new GPS so it wouldn't fall and smash, and went through all of the items. Monica has the scarf, which I told her to wash. Bobo has the piece of wood. The Minister of Commerce has the photographs 
and I have the little magnet on my refrigerator, which I brought in today. And Jaina, I've been going back and forth. I was going to give that to you. I, I can't do it. Can't do it. Not yet. Not yet. And then, of course, the family who found the boat got to keep the Richmond School photograph. So, got her all. I mean, she's in pretty good shape for, you know, being two years at sea almost. Hardly any barnacles. I had to put a new coat of paint on her, which, sorry, Lucy, it was not beautiful like your guys' paint job. It was pretty ugly. And got her all sealed up and ready to go. Went to bed pretty happy again that night. So the next morning, I'm getting up at about 7.30 in the morning, and this is the breakfast area. And again, I was one of two people staying at the hotel. And I'm walking out to get a cup of instant coffee, which is the only coffee on the atoll. And I hear, Konnichiwa! Mate, are you ready? And I look, and there is Outback Gary shouting at me from across the hotel lobby. And I think, Am I really with this guy? <laughs> so Gary tells me, I stayed in last night so I could be fresh for the big launch. Grab your midi boat and let's get the hell out of here and get this boat on our way to Japan. I slammed my coffee and I said, let's go. <laughs> so we loaded up Gary's car with the mini boat and we spent the next three and a half hours. Gary may have stopped for a beer or two <laughs> on the way. <laughs> And the first place we go is to the main wharf. It's super, super busy. And Gary is very concerned about launching it here. I thought it was a pretty good spot. But he said, I don't want these fishermen messing with our mini boat. <laughs> and then he points to a, a little Navy, uh, a little Australian Navy ship. And he said, plus that Navy ship, they might think we're spies. <laughs> so, okay. So we drive down to the southern tip of the atoll but the tide is out, and it's a good spot, good wind, but it was a mile walk over the coral to get to a spot where we could get the mini boat in, and again, Gary's gout was acting up. So we're driving across the Nippon Causeway, which is this causeway that makes getting from Beso Town to the airport capable in a half an hour instead of four hours, which it used to be on the bumpy road going from island to island. And Gary literally pulls over on the side of this causeway with the rear end sticking out, it says, what do you think about this, mate? And I noticed that there was a little channel going out over through the reef. And I said, I think it looks pretty good. And Gary said, F, mate, it's happening. I told you, let's send this boat to Japan. And I really, he did tell me, he told me he was going to make this happen. And he made it happen. So, Put the sail on the mini boat, walk it into the channel. Some friendly fishermen come up and of course want to know what we're doing and we explain the whole situation to them. And under their watchful eye, I swim the mini boat through the channel, over the reef, and ceremoniously push her out to sea. Pretty amazing, right? Until the currents start bringing the mini boat back to the reef. And the waves weren't like super huge, but I don't know if you've ever been smashed into coral. It does not feel good. And so, just, you know, what's going on? All of a sudden, the fisherman hands me his slippers, which were his flip-flops, and says, wait here, dives in, grabs the mini boat just before it crashes into the reef, swims it out 50 meters, pushes it out to shore, and she sails away. Oh! So apparently it's an Aussie boat now as well. <laughs> so even over Gary screaming and yelling, Konnichiwa, and all of this. So this is me right here. This is a fisherman right here. And I'm treading water, holding on to his slippers, watching the Nishikaze sail away. And I thought to myself, this can't be real. How is this happening? It was truly an out-of-body experience. At that moment, I reflected on the meaning of the Nishikaze. Not only the name, which means Western Wind in Japanese, which she was currently catching, 
but the overall meaning of the project. This mini boat was built by kids in the United States and Japan to foster a friendship between them. And right now she was sailing away from Tarawa where 75 years ago, 6,000 of both of our countrymen died fighting each other. And I thought, did the Nishikaze have this plan all along? And then I heard Gary yelling, Konnichiwa! <laughs> and so the fishermen and I, we walk back, and as we're walking back to the causeway, Gary keeps, I keep on saying, thank you, thank you, God, thank you so much. And Gary kept on saying, thank yous, don't buy beer, but Gary does. <laughs> but they didn't accept our invitation for beer. And the fishermen explained to us that they were part of the LDS church and that they don't drink. And there was a lot, you were basically Catholic or you were LDS in Tarawa. Um, and so Gary said, hey, that's fine, mate. We'll buy you some soda and chips. And they were very happy to oblige us. So we went back to Bloody Mary's and we had some Sprites and some Cokes and some French fries. And it turns out the fisherman who dove in to save the Nishikaze was the head police inspector for the entire country of Kiribati and travels with the president when he leaves the country. And his friend said, he was just doing, his name is Derek. He said, Derek was just doing his job, keeping people in mini boats safe. <laughs> So again, the Nishikaze was relaunched on June 16th, 2019 and started sailing directly towards Japan. So that night, as the Nishikaze was sailing out, I went to the feast at Monica's. Now, her father-in-law owns a store, which isn't much of a store, they sell a few things, but he was considered pretty rich. So he had this amazing pool table and he charged neighbors 25 cents to play a game of pool. And this area was like the communal spot through all of these huts. And so, since nobody really spoke English, they brought the priest in to be my escorter for the night. And the priest was really excited because he got to drink kava which is this drink right here, which costs money for free all night long. The problem is, is a kava is um, sort of an intoxicating drink and uh, kind of has the effect of Novocaine. And by the end of the night, you, you, it was, his whole mouth was numb. But he was a really nice guy and spoke really good English and it was great to have him there. So before the feast started, Monica came out with her surprise. She had a special outfit made for me. And it has my name in the Kiribati language, which is Knit, and then also my name, Nate Sandal. And I was going to wear the garb today, but it was just a little too cold out there. <laughs> but again, somebody who has nothing spends her hard-earned money to buy me a gift. It was really, really touching. So the feast was amazing. That's kind of hard to see here, but we had fish. They killed the family pig. We had chicken. We had breadfruit. We had it all, except for I didn't know. We had coconuts to drink out of, but I didn't know how to eat that fish. And so the priest yells, and Monica comes over, and she just rips its head off and skin off. And it was one of the, I don't even like fish, but it was one of some of the better fish that I'd ever had. So I brought some little museum tokens and I gave them to all the kids in the family and we just sang and just had a really electric night. And I was thinking, is this really my life? Am I here? And they use it, they, you know, you go to a feast, but you're feasting. Oh, we're feasting tonight. We're going, we're feasting. And I thought, I'm feasting. It was amazing. So the next morning, as I'm driving back to the airport, it all sort of hits on me what had just happened. I came here with no plan because I couldn't have a plan. And somehow it got pulled off. The tagline for Kiribati is Kiribati is for travelers, not for tourists. And that's true enough. You won't be served fancy drinks on a beach. The electricity and plumbing is spotty at best. But what makes Kiribati truly special are the amazing, happy, caring people who call this most endangered country in the world home. And without their kindness, the Nishikaze and all she represents would have been lost forever. So it's with my true gratitude that I thank the people of Kiribati for what they did to bring the Nishikaze home. 
And finally, after the trip in Fiji, my first drink with ice. <laughs> So that is the story of the rescue of the Nishikazi. Um, she does have a quick little epilogue, so I thought instead of having people ask questions, what happened next, I would run through very briefly what had happened afterwards. So the Nishikazi sailed for another 28 days and 678 nautical miles. And then she turned around, <laughs> skirted through Tarawa. She was less than a mile from running ashore in Tarawa again. And she circled back by and I was up all night tracking her. It was very panicking. <laughs> and then a couple of days later, landed on another atoll. <laughs> so luckily I had made some connections. So Derek, the police inspector, I asked him if, you know, hey, could you help me? This is what had happened. And turns out somebody he knew from that village was actually in Tarawa at the doctor. So they were trying to get word, but the internet was down. Turns out a couple of hours later had this picture of the Nishikazi and she was safe. And so another thing I should mention is just like there's stereotypes in the United States about what kind of person you are, where you live, each one of the 33 Atolls has its own special stereotype. And as you can see, this one was known for not crazy, crazy lovers. And so that was a myth of their island that it was full of jealous women. Um, I was just glad that it didn't go to the atoll that's famous for stabbings. <laughs> so we got the word out and got some pictures of the boat. They agreed to relaunch it when the weather was good. And a couple of days later, the guy took it out on his outrigger and launched the Nishikazi again, where she sailed for another 17 days and 513 nautical miles. And apparently the Nishikazi really loves Kiribati <laughs> because she sailed through, she sailed through the lagoon and came out the other side and was stuck on the beach. This is during my summer vacation, and I am just, and I spent like three days of my vacation just trying to track down this mini boat. We finally got the ocean link up on the satellite, and we're able to get word, and it turns out, and Derek was very upset, that the people who found it broke the cargo hatch when they found her to try to see what was inside. So currently the Nishikazi is sitting in, hopefully in a hut, waiting for me to get her a new cargo hatch to be installed. So if anybody either has two weeks or $5,000, talk to me afterwards, we can make this happen. <laughs> but again, we wish she was still out sailing, but this mini boat has linked students in Japan and the United States to a whole new country Kiribati. 517 days total at sea, 13,236 nautical miles, and I hope she's not done yet. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I did talk at you for almost an hour, and I apologize for that. If there are any questions, um, Julia has a microphone and just raise your hand and I will briefly answer any of your questions. So you have other boats, one near Anchorage, one that has been returned, one boat that's been returned here. Um, and yeah, so the boat that uh, crashed in Sitka, Alaska, and then we went up, fixed it, relaunched it, and then it crashed into a volcano near Homer, Alaska. Um, that boat is currently being fixed up right now and is gonna go back up to Homer and be relaunched by the end of the school year. There was a boat that crashed in Baja, Mexico, and just like the Nishikazi, when I saw a picture of it, its GPS had dropped down. So I was not putting that boat into the water. I found a surfer who was willing to drive it back to her home in Colorado, where the teacher of that class drove to Colorado this summer to pick it up. It is now back at that school, Hildalati Elementary School. The students are fixing it back up right now, and it's going back to Mexico this February or March to be relaunched. So every boat that's been shipwrecked and recovered has 
either been fixed in relaunch or is in the process of being fixed in relaunch. And like I always told Jana, you know, those boringly good boats, you know, it's actually kind of more exciting when they do start crashing, to be honest. <laughs> Just, you know, I'm still waiting for one to go to Hawaii, though. <laughs> yes? How scary. Yeah, that's funny that you mentioned that. <laughs> So I emailed Gary the other day, and I got a response from him yesterday. And I, so Gary was assuring me that he was coming here to go on a cruise from Seattle, and I was going to have him down. I was like, oh, I've got to show you around. <laughs> and so I asked him all these questions and was like, Gary, when are you going back to Tarawa? I need to, because Gary's like, I'll get that hatch out there for you. And I was like, Gary, when are you going back to Tarawa? I want to get this hatch going. When are you coming to Seattle? Happy New Year. And his response back to me was, thanks, mate. <laughs> So, you know, and his, you know, and I think my spelling is atrocious. Gary, you know, so Gary has a hard time putting the emails together as well. But if you need water quality or tank needs, he gets it done. Yes. So there's a whole group of boats kind of in a doldrum between here and Japan. Yeah, and actually, so this morning as well, one of the boats that we launched um, on Thanksgiving Day is now further offshore of Japan than one of the boats we launched a year ago from Japan. It's stuck in this little like circle pattern over and over and over again. And so I talked to the teacher yesterday and she was like, I hope this big storm that's coming through is gonna kick us out of here and get their boat going. So it's really, um, one of the other things that we're doing this year is we're launching drifters, which are like mini boats, but their sails are underwater. And that's to calculate the current so that we can compare what a mini boat is doing with the wind and what it would be doing just with the current as well. So we're trying to up our game. And also uh, some of the new boats have air and water temperature sensors on them. And thanks to Pacific Power, who's a program sponsor this year, the mini boat being launched next month will be the first ever with solar powered running lights. <laughs> very cool, very, very cool. Yes. Is the original group of students that built the Nishikawa still connected and still following this as well? Um, um, Janet, would you like to answer that? Um, yeah, so those fourth graders, they uh, studied at Japanese immersion school, so they spent half a day in English instruction, half a day in Japanese instruction, and those kids are now sixth graders. As a cohort, there were 50 of them. The Nishikawa, they had uh, 27 kids, but now they're at sixth graders and they are still in the same program. They're right. 25 of them still. But yeah, we send them updates and they check in and their parents follow and their parents tag us and the new uh, new boats get on the news. Did you see the new boat? You know, so everyone's very much so connected. And um, before I boarded that flight to Fiji, it was, was that like the last day of school? Or the second to last day of school? Yeah, so right before I went to the airport, I stopped at Richmond Elementary and um, we got all the students from the year before together and we talked about what was happening and told them it was, it was really, really cool. And you know, especially like Lucy, you see a picture of you two years ago and you think, wow, it's just a little kid back then. <laughs> um, and that's what's great about, and I always try to pick smaller schools or smaller classrooms where, you know, amazing things happen year after year. And if you're in a school of like 2,000 kids, it's hard to pull those kids back together. But say, for example, if you were in third grade at Hildalati Elementary School in Napa, and now you're in fifth grade, you're all still together and there's like one class of fifth graders. So that makes it really easy to continue on the program in other years as well. All right, well, if you got that five grand, you just let me know, come up here and we'll talk. Thank you very much. Um